Hey guys, so uh, the following is my first attempt at recording a lecture video. I just chose to do it on parametric curves. Um, I'd really appreciate any feedback on improvements that I could make for my methodology, maybe my handwriting, whatever, because I want to try and get more serious about making tutoring videos. Um, thanks for watching, and I, I appreciate the feedback. All right, so let's get started talking about vector functions and space curves. Before we get into the whole vector part of it, let's just talk about regular functions, which I'm going to denote by my shorthand fxn. So a function is a rule that we assigns each element in the domain to each element in the range. So it's a rule that maps each element in the domain to an element in the range. Um, on the other hand, a vector valued function, so a vector valued function, um, or you could just call this a vector function. What a vector function does is it is a function where the domain is the set of real numbers. And the uh, range is a set of vectors. So for the scope of this class, Calc 3, we're most interested in vector functions R. So most interested in vector functions R, whose values are 3D vectors. So for example, um, say for all t in the domain of R, um, there exists, there should exist a unique vector I'll call it v3 just to uh, demonstrate that it's three-dimensional, denoted by r of t. So say if our three-dimensional vector has three components, so f of t, g of t, and h of t are the components of our vector r of t then f, g, and h are all called the component functions. So these are called the component functions of r. And what that means is that our vector r of t is in reality just a vector made up of where the first component is f of t, second component is g of t, and third component is h of t. That should be a t. And just, to, just as a review of notation, we can also represent this vector in terms of the uh, unit component vectors. So this could be f of t times the unit vector in the x direction i plus g of t times the unit vector in the y component j plus h of t times the unit vector in the z component k. Uh, and just a quick note that in this case, our dependent variable t it, it's t because usually it's in most applications it represents time, but it, it can represent anything. So let's start off with a quick example about the domain of a vector function. A vector function. So if I say I give you a function r of t that's equal to um, where the x component is t cubed, the y component is the natural log of 3 minus t, and the z component is root of t. The component functions then are f of t becomes t cubed, g of t becomes natural log of 3 minus t, and h of t is just equal to root t. And all I'm doing is I'm saying it's just a notation thing where I'm saying this is f, this is g, this is h. 
um, so the domain of this entire vector function r will consist of all values of t for which r of t is defined and that's an important point so I'll write that down so the domain of r of t is all values of t for which r of t is defined. So we have three functions to deal with now. We have t cubed, we have natural log of 3 minus t, and we have root of t. And our restrictions here is that all we need this um, first function, t cubed, this exists for all t in the reals. This um, only ex this function, the natural log of 3 minus t, whatever is inside the natural log has to be greater than 0. So we need 3 minus t to be greater than 0. Um, and here, this function, the root square root of t, can only exist when t is greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, we are always limited by the weakest link in the chain. In this case, it's this middle function here. So this middle function gives us the smallest domain combined with, so we'll say that the domain of R is the set from 0 inclusive to 3. All right. Um, given that this is a calculus class, obviously we're going to talk about limits a bit. So let's start talking about limits of vector functions. So the limit of vector functions I'm pretty sure you can um, figure out at this point that to find the limit of a vector function it's defined by taking the limits of its component functions of component functions Let's just write this out in a red box. Um, so the definition of the limit of a vector function if we have our vector function r of t which has its three components um, f of t, g of t, h of t then um, by definition the limit as t approaches a of r of t is just equal to the limit in each of its components so it would be the limit as t approaches a of f of t for the x component the limit as t approaches a of g of t the y component and the limit as t approaches a of h of t. And uh, another thing is you have to make sure these limits exist. So this is only provided that the limits exist. I'll box this off. Okay. So the when calculating limits of vector functions, the rules that you use to calculate the limits of each component is just the same as the rules that you use for calculating the limits of real valued functions. With that, let's go into our second example. So I want you to find the limit as t approaches 0 of r of t, where r of t is defined um, and I'll say 1 plus t cubed t times e to the negative t and then sine t over t. So by this definition we have up here, definition 1, we want to find the limit of components. So it this uh, the limit as t approaches 0 of r of t is equal to the limit as 
t approaches 0 of 1 plus t cubed. The limit as t approaches 0 of t e to the negative t. And the limit as t approaches 0 of sine t over t. And I want you to pause here real quick and try and solve this on your own before we go forward. All right, so we know that this first component, if you just, it's just a simple polynomial, so we can substitute in uh, t equals zero and we get one for the first component. Uh, by calculating out the limits using, I'm not gonna write out the work here, but you will get that the second component is just gonna be zero. And the third component, sine t over t as t approaches zero, you'll remember from calc one, that's just one. So as t approaches zero, we get a vector one, zero, one. Um, and another important thing when talking about vector functions is continuity of vector functions. So we can say that a vector r, so a vector function r, is continuous at a, where a is just a, a point. It's continuous at a point a if and only if the limit as t approaches a t approaches a of r of t is equal to the function r of a. So you're starting to see there's a, a lot of parallels between our vector functions and those functions that you've been you've grown accustomed to from calc 1 and 2. Uh, by extension this is only true this is true if and only if the component functions f, g, and t, or f, g, and h, sorry, are continuous at a. So now that we've talked about continuity, we can talk about continuous vector functions and space curves. Continuous vector functions So let's say we have our component functions. So f, g, and h, and there are continuous real valued functions on some interval i. In that case, we'll say that the set C of all points x, y, and z in space. So we can create a set C. Um, in this case, our x is just f of t, y is g of t, and z is h of t. So x is f of t, y is g of t, z is h of t. We'll call this two because we're going to reference this later. Um, and t varies throughout our interval i. That is what we call a space curve. You can kind of think of this as a curve that's being traced out by a particle. Whose position at time t is given by uh, that our, our component functions f of t, g of t, and h of t. So let's take uh, our function, if it, our function r of t, if that's the position vector of our point f of t, g of t, h of t on our uh, curve c, any continuous vector function r will define a space curve c that's traced out by the tip of r of t. So but before I write this down, let me just draw it out so uh, the visualization can help. So this is our coordinate planes. We've got 
our z axis this will be x z and I'll say y is like over in this direction if I have some curve let's make it go like that let's say I have this is my point P get at a certain time t which is given by f of t g of t h of t at any given point t I have a vector pointing from the origin to that point oh crap I have a vector pointing from the origin to this point r of t where the components are f of t g of t and h of t so r is just the position vector of our point on this curve. And if this vector function r is continuous, it defines our space curve that we're tracing out with the tip of this point. So let's do one more example. So I want you to just describe the curve, described by the vector function r of t is equal to one plus t 2 plus 5t and then negative 1 plus 6t and I'd like you to pause the video and try this for yourself before we go over the solution okay so I have my components where x y and z in each of those so that'll x is 1 plus t y is 2 plus 5t and z is a negative 1 plus 6t uh, we could also rewrite this into the format our vector r is equal to an initial vector r0 plus t times another vector v. In this case, our r0 would be 1, 2, negative 1, so the constant part of all three functions, plus t times our other vector 1, 5, 6. And you'll notice that this is the equation, each of these gives the equation. Each of our components gives the equation for a straight line. So obviously, our ending vector will also describe a line passing through our original point, 1, 2, negative 1. To our point, 1, 5, 6. So, you can also represent plane curves using vector notation. So, for example, if I said x is equal to t squared minus 2t and y is equal to t plus 1, um, I don't have a z component here. It's not a space curve. In this case, it's a plane curve. This would be represented by the vector function r of t is equal to t squared minus 2t, so our x component and then t plus 1 as our y component. Um, you just don't have a z component. So let's do one more practice problem. This one I want you to try and sketch out. I want you to sketch out a curve given by the vector equation r of t is equal to cosine t sine of t and just t. Okay, so I'd like you to pause the video and try this out now. Cool. So what you'll see is that if we take, this is our x component, this is y, and this is our z component. And if we, we have sine and cosine, and we know that if x squared plus y squared will be equivalent to cosine squared t plus sine squared t which is 1. This curve must lie on our cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. So curve must lie on cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. So our point, let's, let's draw out our coordinate axes. So that'll be my y-axis. Um, I'll draw only the positive part of the x-axis and then 
that's my Z. So I've got this cylinder now. Let me try and draw that a little bit better. I've got this cylinder. And my point, any point X, Y, Z will lie right above my point X, Y, Z equals zero. And this is going to move counterclockwise around x squared plus y squared is 1. So what's happening is this function is tracing out a helix where I'm starting off when t is 0, this will be 1, this will be 0, this will be 0. So I start off at that point 1, 0, 0. And I move around the curve until I get to this point right above the y-axis. This point is 0, 1, pi over 2. This is what happens when I put in uh, t equals pi over 2. So cosine will go to uh, 0, sine will become 1, and t is just pi over 2. And doing this, I'll trace out a curve around the entirety of the surface and end up right there. Cool. So you can also you can see that if we were to look at this from a top-down view, our projection onto our xy plane, it's a plane curve where r of t is equal to cosine of t, sine of t, and then z is just 0 because it's a projection on the xy plane, which is by definition when z is equal to 0. Um, so let's do, let's do one more example. Let's say I want you to find a vector equation and parametric equations for a line segment that joins the point P, which is given by 1, 3, negative 2, to Q, which is 2, negative 1, 3. So in this case, I have my vector function, r of t is equal to 1 minus t r0 plus t times r1 where t is between 0 and 1. Um, the reason for this is you can see in your book 9.5.4. So my initial vector I'm going to say is p. So r0 is just p, which is 1, 3, negative 2. And I'll say r1 is equal to 2, negative 1, 3. And so then plugging this in back into our formula, r of t is equal to 1 minus t times r naught, 1, 3, negative 2, plus t times r1, 2, negative 1, 3, where t is between 0 and 1. Solving that out, we'll just get 1 plus t for our x component, 3 minus 4t for our y component, and negative 2 plus 5t for our z component with 0, with t be being between 0 and 1. To get this into our parametric equation, that's our vector equation. As a parametric equation, so vector, and then parametric, we have x is equal to 1 plus t y is equal to 3 minus 4t, and z is equal to negative 2 plus 5t. Once again, our domain is defined as t between 0 and 1. All right, let's do one last example, and then that will be the end of this lecture. Uh, what example is this? 4, oops, 5, 6. So I want you to find a, we're going to find a vector function that represents the curve of intersection of the cylinder x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 and plane x plus, or sorry, y plus z is equal to 2. So if you were to sketch this out on a set of coordinate axes, it would look a little something like this. That's your z. That's our x, 
dazu ein. Have my cylinder. Man, that's a really ugly cylinder. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, and intersecting that is going to be a plane x plus z is equal to 2. Let me draw that in a different color. So I have my plane going across. It should be pointed a little bit more down. And our cross section is going to be given by an intersection that kind of looks like this. We're just taking a conic slice of this cylinder. So plane is x plus z, or y plus z, is equal to 2. It should be x squared plus y squared is 1. Um, so just graphing out just the vector function, x, y, z, we're going to end up with a curve that looks a little something like that, where it's rotating um, counterclockwise around our z-axis. Okay, so you can see that our projection of c onto our x, y plane is just the circle x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 and z is equal to 0. And that's similar to what we did in example 2, where x, in this case, x is cosine t, y is sine t for t between 0 and 2 pi, because it's, uh, that, would, that would be a full rotation of the circle. And then from our equation of a plane, we have y plus z is equal to 2, which we can rearrange to say z is equal to 2 minus y. And from before, we know our y component is sine t, so z is equal to 2 minus sine t. So uh, the parametric representation of our, our, our curve c, our space curve c, is x is equal to cosine t, y is equal to sine t, and z is equal to 2 minus sine t. From this, we can go to a vector equation where our function r of t is just the same thing, but each component is written in as a vector. So actually, I'll write this in unit vector notation, just to be clear. This will be cosine t times i plus sine t times j plus 2 minus sine t times k for t both of these are on the domain at t between 0 and 2 pi. All right, that's the end of this lecture. I'll see you guys next time.